Pokemon Crystal, a Generation 2 Pokemon game released in the United States all the way back in July 2001. This game was legendary among kids of that time due to its combination of the original Pokemon region Kanto as well as the new region Johto. As a kid, I could not believe that I got to take my Hall of Fame team from the Elite Four over to the next region in the same game. I have so many incredible memories from playing this game, but Pokemon players soon realized that Generation 2, including Pokemon Crystal, was majorly flawed. From the atrocious mid-game level curve, most new Johto Pokemon being inaccessible, to the unfortunately empty Kanto region, this game had so much missed potential. That's where Pokemon Crystal Legacy comes in. A newly released ROM hack, courtesy of Smith Plays and Team, this game was made purely as an attempt to perfect the original Pokemon Crystal. Many ROM hacks will completely overhaul an old game, changing Pokemon types, adding newer Pokemon, and even adding features from the newest games. This ROM hack is different. It changes only things that will fix Crystal's flaws, while avoiding major changes that don't feel like the original Pokemon Crystal. If you want to learn more about the changes this ROM made in this game, check out Smith Play's original video, which I have linked in the description below. In today's video, I will be attempting a hardcore nuzlocke of Pokemon Crystal Legacy. Is it better than the original? Is it harder than the original? You'll have to watch and find out. And the Nuzlocke rules are in the description. Now's a great time to remind you to subscribe. We can't hit our 10,000 sub goal this year without you subscribing. Oh, and we're giving away a Nintendo Switch and a copy of Scarlet or Violet if we hit the goal this year, so let's do it. Our journey starts like any other Pokemon Crystal run. We wake up in our room, naturally, we overslept, and head over to Professor Elm's lab. But not before our future rival attempts to Hulk smash us in broad daylight. Here we select our starter from the standard three, Cyndaquil, Chikorita, or Totodot. I grab Totodile and our journey begins. After completing the trip to Mr. Pokemon's house, we take on our unnamed rival for the first time. We're able to scratch his Chikorita a few times to take it out. The two level advantage is plenty to make this fight a cakewalk. After returning to the lab, we get access to Pokeballs for the first time. As you can see, this is running pretty standard to Vanilla Crystal so far. Our first encounter on Route 29 is Pidgey, which we capture with ease. This game made some changes to movesets and Pidgey's only notable one is Gust, learned two levels earlier at level seven. However, a really cool one later is Pidgeot gets access to extreme speed upon evolving at level 36. There are a ton of moveset changes, so I won't note them all, but I did want to mention these early on. We grab our second encounter on Route 30, a Caterpie. This will have some use early game when it evolves to Butterfree, but will likely fall off as we go along. Soon after, I remember that Route 46 exists, so I backtrack and catch a Spira, a Pokemon that I can never seem to keep alive in Nuzlocke. Let's see if we can redeem ourselves this run. After making our way past the trainers on Route 30, we get access to the bottom of Dark Cave. Here, Crystal Legacy actually added a potential Larvitar spawn. Hoping for this, though it can be weak for essentially the entire Johto run, I enter the cave. But we encounter Pokemon Cave's best friend, Zubat, which I immediately crit and kill. This was not intentional, and that's our first missed encounter. Crobat is insane, so this is a pretty big loss. Immediately after this sad time, I encounter Mareep on Route 31. OG Crystal fans know that for some atrocious reason, Mareep was not even in Crystal, and even in Gold and Silver games, it wasn't accessible till after Faulkner. Thankfully, Crystal Legacy fixed this problem, so we have an electric sheep. But this isn't the end of our pre-Faulkner encounters. We grab a Ghastly from Sprout Tower. This evolves at level 42. No more cursed link cables. Thank the maker. Uh, thanks Smith plays, I guess. Now it's time to take on Faulkner. With an increased level cap to 10 and a new ace, Faulkner may be harder than ever. Let's find out. I lead our electric sheep and he sends out his classic Pidgey. We take a little damage from quick attack, but a thunder shock is enough to KO. Next, he brings out his new ace, Knocked Out. This bulky bird growls at us. Uh, do birds growl? And we hit for a third with thunder shock. It's tackled the next turn, does decent damage, and another thunder shock brings it down to yellow HP, procking its berry. It goes for another tackle, putting us in crit range, and our returning shock nearly KOs. Fortunately, our berry heals us enough to safely finish it off without worrying about critical hits, obtaining our first badge. So far, so good, but we have a long way to go. After grabbing the mystery egg from Professor Elm's aid, I realized that we actually had access to a patch of grass on Route 36 as well. I capture a Bellsprout, a decent Pokemon, but later in the run realized that I had potential for the newly added Hound Hour at night. Drat! But still, this spindly sprout might have some use in him. We head south to Route 32 where we encounter a new Pokemon, Wooper. This thing is awesome for Nuzlocke due to its water ground typing. I gotta say, I feel like I have superpowers playing this. Finally, just doing a standard Nuzlocke allows for so many encounters compared to monotype runs. And man, this game really allows us to have a balanced team. And speaking of new encounters, we actually run into an old encounter, Zubat. Last time we knocked it out in Dark Cave, so why not appear in Union Cave? And I accidentally ran away attempting to swap Pokemon. These Zubats are cursed! Oh, and we could have gotten a Cubone there. 
That would have been cool. But fear not. Hope for the bat is not lost. Once we get through the cave in Azalea, we head down to Slowpoke Well to attempt to stop Team Rocket, but not before I encounter a third Zubat. Because of all my screwing around and not catching a Zubat in the previous two encounters, I actually miss a guaranteed Slowpoke here, which would have been an incredible Pokemon for this run. However, I do at least finally catch the Zubat, adding it to our team. The saga is finally over. I finally decide to backtrack to Violet City and catch a Magikarp with the old rod. Then I head back to Route 33 and grab a Rattata, a classic Pokemon that was going to find its way onto our team eventually. Next, I decide to run some laps to grind our Togepi's happiness. Togetic's resistance to Bug with his flying type, as well as its access to Charm, will be invaluable against Bugsy. After leveling our team to the level cap, it is time to challenge the new and improved Bug Boy. His claims to never lose still haven't changed, though. He starts off with a new team addition, Pineco, and we lit our Pidgey. A Gust does just under half, and the Pom Pom goes for Harden. Another Gust does decent damage, and it retaliates with Headbutt. A third Gust takes it down, so Bugsy goes into his second new Pokemon, Ledian. I swap to our newly evolved Flaffy, who eats a Thunder Punch easily. The next turn, Ledian sets up Reflect, useless against our Fluffy Sheep's Thundershock, which does over a third. However, the Ladybug is able to confuse us with Supersonic, but our Flaffy is unfazed and hits through with a crit, taking Ledian out. Great start. Finally, Bugsy brings out the dreaded Scyther. This Pokemon is challenging in regular runs, but it's even better in Crystal Legacy. One of the few move pool type changes was the HM Cut. It was changed to a bug type move and increased to 65 base power. This stab move on an already powerful Scyther could single-handedly end our run. And speaking of, I swapped to our defensive wall Togetic, who gets critical hit with a resistant cut, which still does tons of damage. From here, it starts to build up Fury Cutter as I go for Charm, harshly lowering Scyther's attack. It hits two more times with Fury Cutter as we charm it down to minus six attack. I swap into Zubat, who quad resists Bug, and go for Gust. Yes, this is a new move added for Zubat in Crystal Legacy. Zubat takes massive damage from the swap in and the following turns Fury Cutter, and does about 40% in return. We really need this Scyther to miss an attack. I swap to Pidgey, who takes another Fury Cutter, but recovers with a Berry. It hits again as I go for Sand Attack, a move I don't usually like to use, but in this case, we're desperate. I swap to Spearow, and guess what? It still hits me and nearly KOs. I swap to Togetic, which, of course, gets hit by another Fury Cutter. At this point, it's at max damage, so we really, really need a miss. From here, I decide to YOLO it and click Metronome. Scyther manages to hit its 10th straight Fury Cutter, three straight with an accuracy drop, as our metronome rolls string shot. Actually, not awful. I'm forced to swap again into Butterfree, taking an 11th straight Fury Cutter. This Scyther is an absolute menace. But fortunately, I have the most powerful mechanic in the game on my side, sleep. I didn't want to roll into a 75% chance, but Scyther being a complete jerk forced my hand. From here, Butterfree stays in and attacks, but Scyther immediately wakes up. I go for another Sleep Powder, which lands again. The next turn, I String Shot again to help us outspeed Scyther, and he wakes up again. A third Sleep Powder lands, and this time, it is enough. Scyther finally accepts his fate as a nap time bug, and our bug saves the run. Sheesh! That was a ridiculous fight, but we are here unscathed. Immediately after, we have a rival fight. Zubat leads, and we counter with the Sheep. A Bite flinches us, and the next turn, its signature move, Supersonic, confuses Flaffy, which hurts itself in confusion. Classic Zubat. I swap to Butterfree, who takes damage from Bite. The next turn, I put it to sleep with Sleep Powder, allowing us to swap back to Flaffy, which hits with Thundershock. The next turn, the Bat wakes up and bites, but we avoid the flinch this time and finish it off. Next, he brings out Larvitar. I swap to Croconaw as it sets up Sandstorm. He then swaps into Bayleaf, which takes our Water Gun easily. I swap to Zubat, which is growled by Bayleaf. After taking significant damage from Leech Life and Thunderstorm, he swaps back into Larvitar, so we in turn switch to Croconaw, only for him to swap back into Bayleaf, causing us to return the favor back into Zubat. He's playing 4D chess. Finally, our rival realizes that his efforts are futile, and we take out Bayleaf with a couple of Leech Lives. He brings out Larvitar for the final time, and we swap into the desired matchup, Croconaw, which is able to take it out with a water gun. That was like watching Rocky 4 when Creed keeps getting back up thinking he has a chance, but we all know how that ended. After this, we make our way through the forest and obtain the cut TM. Bug move, remember? After exiting, we grab a Jigglypuff on Route 34, as well as the baby egg from the daycare, which I decide to hatch in Cherry Grove later. Before facing the gym and Goldenrod, I head north to Route 35 to get another encounter and run into Fire Breather Waltz. This guy's pretty scary in Vanilla Crystal because he has two Magmar, and he is just as scary in this game, with the first one nearly taking out my Croconaw, and the second actually taking out my Spearow! Rip. First loss of the run. Luckily, it wasn't worse. I decided to make my way back to Goldenrod and face the gym before taking any more unnecessary losses to random trainers. Now is a good time to mention that Crystal Legacy added a berry shop to the right of the gym, which sells all the berries accessible in the game. Some, like the gold berry, aren't available until later in the game. After leveling our team to the level cap of 21, we take on Witness.
Whitney. She still leads her classic Clefairy, and I send out our just evolved Weeping Bell. Turn one Sleep Powder, followed by three straight growth turns, then Razor Leaf. It's still not enough to KO Clefairy, who wakes up and hits us with Headbutt. Because it survived, I figured the best move was to put it back to sleep and go for more growths. After two more, I KO it with another Razor Leaf, then take out her newly added Teddy Ursa. Finally, she sends out the dreaded Mill Tank. It goes for a rollout, and we respond with Razor Leaf. And we miss! A 95% accurate move misses at the worst possible time. After freaking out about how awful my luck is, I go for another Razor Leaf, taking a ton of damage from rollout turn two, and of course, leaving Milk Tank in red HP. Five Groves can't KO this thing? I'm forced to swap into Quagsire, who resists the third turn enough to also tank a fourth turn rollout and KO with Bubble Beam. Thank goodness that Razor Leaf missed didn't cost us another Pokemon. Even in Crystal Legacy, Milk Tank reigns supreme. Now that we've defeated Whitney, our new level cap makes it easier to traverse the routes above without worry. I quickly grab the Crystal Legacy buffed Yanma on Route 35 and continue north through the Wrigley Tree to Ekertik. Now that Sudo Wudo is gone, I can easily make my way back to Cherry Grove and hatch our baby egg that we acquired at the daycare, which turns out to be a Cleffa, and shiny at that. This ROM increases shiny odds, so it isn't all that special. I also grab our Gift Eevee from Bill and Goldenrod. This is a very flexible encounter that can evolve into whatever we happen to need based on our encounters. Now we have to fight our rival in Burn Tower. I completely forgot about encounters here. I guess we'll catch this coughing real quick. Now it's rival time. He leads off with a Larvitar. Uh, whoops, I thought it was about to be Zubat. I swap Flaffy into Quagsire, which dodges Larvitar's attack. After taking a Screech, a Bubble Beam KOs. Next comes out Bayleaf, Quagsire's Kryptonite. I go into Crobat and easily tank a Razor Leaf. Wing Attack nearly KOs as Bayleaf hits for minimal damage and we finish it with a second Wing Attack. Next out is Rimmerade, so I swap to Weeping Bell, who gets crushed by a Psy Beam. I swap again to Gyarados, who's able to tank a couple of Psy Beams and take it out. Out comes Golbat, who naturally confuses us and causes Gyarados to hit itself. A swap to Flappy takes damage, but is able to get off a paralyzing Thunder Wave. A Thundershock does decent damage as his Confuse Ray is nullified by our Bitter Berry, allowing Flappy to hit for more Thundershock damage. Bite takes us down to Yellow Health, and a third Thundershock ends the fight. The Bat is still his most annoying Pokemon. Speaking of annoying, the fourth gym leader is Morty. Will he have Pokemon outside the Ghastly line? Let's see. He leads with... Haunter, and I send out Morty Killer Crobat. Bite nearly KOs, but Haunter is able to get off a curse, KOing itself. Some things never change. Morty falls with his new addition, Stantler. I swap into Haunter, dodging a Swift. Stantler, unable to damage us, watches helplessly as I take half my HP to curse it. After a couple of turns, it goes down to our Ghastly Ghost. Morty then shows us his other new Pokemon, Mistrevis. This Pokemon can hurt our Haunter, so I swapped Eradicate, hoping for a Shadow Ball, but it doesn't cooperate, hitting our rat for nearly half damage. I swap again to Gyarados, who tanks side wave easily and KOs it with a bite. Finally, Morty sends out Gengar, which does massive damage with Shadow Ball, and Gyarados returns the favor with Bite. I swap back to our rat, who is only able to be hit by Gengar's Dream Eater and dodge a Shadow Ball, allowing us to finish it off with Pursuit. The addition of Stantler and Mischievous make this fight a lot more interesting and Morty's team overall way cooler. Well done! After defeating our ghostly opponent, I make my way to Mount Mortar in search of some spooky encounters. Whoa, what is this thing? A floating rock with arms? Okay, we've all seen a Geodude before. It's not spooky. And this thing evolves at level 36 in Crystal Legacy. Next, I meander my way to Route 38 and encounter a Tauros. This is an awesome Pokemon that was formerly a 1% encounter, but was made more common for this ROM hack. Our encounter on Route 39 is a Dodo Duo. Taekwondo's retrieve the melon! After running through the lighthouse to obtain our mission for Jasmine, I capture a tentacle on the water-filled Route 40, and shortly after, on Route 41, I encounter the water-flying Pokemon Mantine. This thing refuses to cooperate, and after breaking out of a ton of balls, it eventually KOs itself with confusion. Dang, it always feels bad to lose an encounter. No worries, though. Our box is still filling up with a lot of awesome Pokemon. This will certainly help, as we have to plan for big fights later in the game. And speaking of big, Buff Boy Chuck is next on the agenda. Crystal Legacy has changed many things, but Chuck being Buff Boy is not one of them. Before I start this fight, I should mention that Crystal Legacy fixes the mid-game level curve here by scaling Chuck, Price, and Jasmine based on which order you fight them. Chuck has four Pokemon in this fight, but if you fight him sixth or seventh, he will have five, and if it's seventh, he'll have stronger moves and higher levels. Same goes for the other two, though Jasmine can only be fought sixth or seventh. Now for the fight. He starts off with Hitmontop, and we bring out Purple Bat. A wing attack nearly takes it out, and his responding pursuit crits for about a fifth. Another wing attack finishes it off, and he brings out Pseudo Wudo. Crobat's reign has finally been challenged. I swap into Quagsire, who tanks a rock slide and does massive damage with Surf, but doesn't KO. Faint attack does decent damage, but another Surf is just too much for Mr. Wiggles. Next, he brings out Primate, so I swap into Haunter and dodge his attack. Haunter sets up Confusion, but Primate hits through with an Ice Punch for a quarter. A Nightshade hits for under half, but a Confusion hit and a second Nightshade takes it 
out without taking any more damage. Finally, he brings out his ace, Polyrath. I swap into our now fully grown Ampharos, and thankfully, he just goes for Mind Reader. Ampharos dodges Hypnosis with Matrix-like abilities. I guess Mind Reader doesn't make non-attacking moves land every time, and I land a Thunder Wave in response. A Thunder Punch nearly KOs, but Polyrath is able to land a 50% accurate Dynamic Punch through Paralysis, confusing Ampharos. I have to swap to avoid confusion shenanigans, so I go to Tentacruel, who dodges an attack and immediately KOs. Buff Boy goes down, and we now have access to Fly and the Jasmine fight. After this fight, noticing a severe lack of fire types on our team, I decide to evolve our Eevee into Flareon. Whoa, before you freak out, Crystal Legacy made an awesome change to Flareon in this game, swapping its normally high attack and defense out for a high special attack and defense so it would be actually viable. Now we head west to Ecritique and grab a Gligar in Route 42. A lot of single four Pokemon get slight buffs in this hack, and Gligar is one of them. An added 5 base HP, 10 attack, and 5 speed, plus awesome typing will make this a very relevant Pokemon in this run. We also grab a Giraffe Rig on Route 43, then head up to the Lake of Rage to take out the Red Gyarados, then see Lance and a mysterious man examining the area. After accepting his invitation to become the next Inspector Gadget, it's time to break into the Rocket Hideout. After the strange man attempts to murder the Karate King's brother, Lance takes us underground to the Rocket Base. Inside the base, we once again encounter Rocket Edo, the buffed Rocket from Slowpoke Well. His team is pretty scary again, but we manage to take him out without any losses. After gaining access to the boss's room, we take on Rocket Archer. He leads with the Weezing and we send out Graveler. His smokescreen manages to dodge a magnitude 10 roll and he swaps into Slowbro, who dodges a magnitude 9! I've never been so lucky and also unlucky at once. I swap the anima, but Archer decides to swap into Houndoom? Okay? Confused, I decide to detect and scout Houndoom's next move. I go into Quagsire, who eats the predicted flame wheel. A surf nearly KOs, and Houndoom oddly goes for negative priority roar, bringing out Ampharos. So I swap back to Quagsire and take another flame wheel. Another surf the next turn KOs. I guess he was going for roar again? Are you stupid? Feeling my judgment, Archer decides to bring out the big boy, Tauros. Unsure of what it might go for, I swap into Ampharos and take a Frustration. Then I Thunder Wave to slow down the bull, taking more damage for Frustration. I swap into Crobat, who gets hit hard, then confuse the Tauros, who still hits through for big damage. I go into Graveler, and Tauros, shocked by a rock ball with tiny arms and legs, decides to never attack again as we rock throw it to its doom. Next, Archer brings out Slowbro. I swap Yanma for the type advantage, but Surf nearly KOs. After much deliberating, I decide to stay in with Yanma to avoid a potential wipe and hit for a ton of damage with Twin Needle, allowing Slowbro to finish it off with the Surf, the second death of our run. Rip Yanma. However, its sacrifice is not in vain, giving us a free swap into Ampharos, which KOs with Thunder Punch. Finally, he brings out Weezing as I swap to Graveler and take a Sludge, and then take it out with a couple of Magnitudes. Wow, that fight was way harder than the vanilla game. Fortunately, even with its stat buffs, Yanma isn't extremely useful, so it isn't the worst loss. Our last rocket fight here is against Ariana, which goes much smoother than Archer. Besides a Murkrow Pursuit Scare, we quickly take her down without any casualties. Finally, we have to take out the Electro powering the plant. I attempt to catch the first one, but after a Screech, I think better of it and just take them all out. I don't want to lose a good Pokemon to self-destruct here trying to catch a mid-Electrode. Sorry, Electrode fans. After that, I decide to face Leader Price instead of Jasmine. I feel more confident against Jasmine's 7th gym team than I do against Price's. He leads with Cloyster, and we finally get some use out of our shiny Clefable. Thunder Punch nearly KOs Cloyster as it sets up Rain Dance. Another Thunder Punch is dodged as Price big brains us with a swap to Piloswine. I decide to swap into Quagsire, who takes nearly half. After much deliberation, I decide to stay in and risk the crit range. And Quagsire survives on 5 HP and KOs with a massive Surf. Let's go spaghetti! Price then goes back into his damaged Cloyster, so I swap into Gyarados, tanking a Rain Boosted Surf, and taking it out with Dragon Rage. His next Pokemon, Sneasel, does massive damage with Feign Attack, and we hit for over half damage. I swap into Tentacruel, who nearly gets taken out with two attacks, but KOs the Sneasel with Surf. Next, Price brings out Jinx. I swap to Flareon, who gets hit for massive damage with Psychic, putting us in crit range. I decide to stay in and go for Flame Wheel, but Jinx, predicting our move, sets up Rain, and causes our fire to do less damage. This thing is annoying! Because of this, I decide to go for Bite, but Price ran randomly swaps into Dugong, so we get a free hit. However, the Jinx lives on. With Rain still up, I decide our best option is to go back to Gyarados. I go for Headbutt, hoping for a flinch, but don't get it and take more Surf damage. With the chance of flinch and our Gyarados only dying to a crit, I decide to stay in and go for another flinch, which we don't get, but we get a crit taking it out. Finally, we're down to just the Jinx. I swap into Clefable to avoid a Gyarados death, and we tank a Psychic. Risking Clefable to a crit, we dodge it and take out Jinx, earning us the sixth badge. These fights are starting to ramp up. This man may be old, but he's still frisky. Immediately after, we can fight Jasmine. Her new and improved team is definitely no pushover, so I spend some time strategizing how to beat her. She starts with Skarmory, and we lead Squid. A Surf does over half, and her Skarmory responds with Swagger, confusing our Tentacruel. But we had planned for this. A Bitterberry cures the confusion and allows us to KO Skarmory without the issue. Next, Jasmine brings out her fully evolved Magneton. I swap to Golem, avoiding Magneton's attack. Next, Magneton sets up Rain Dance, and we low roll Magneton 
5, leaving it on red HP. I decide to defense curl in order to stall the rain turns, but get punished when Tri-Attack freezes Golem. I decide to stick with the stalling rain strat, and once it stops, Jasmine swaps out Magneton for Sizor. On the same turn, Golem defrosts. Fearing Steel attacks, I swap to Flareon as Sizor goes for agility. I attempt to cook the Metal Bug with a Flamethrower, but Jasmine predicts my move and brings out Corsola, who easily tanks. I swap to Victory Bell as Corsola sets up more rain. The next turn, a Razor Leaf KOs, which leads to Sizor re-entering the battle. I go back to our Fire Floof as Sizor tries to get speedy again. The next turn, we take decent damage from Metal Claw, but incinerate Sizor with a Flamethrower. She brings out her nearly fainted Magneton, so I swap into Golem, dodging a Thunder. This time, it sets up rain, and we roll a Magnitude 10, KOing it. Finally, she brings out her Ace, Steelix. I swap to Gligar, taking Iron Tail in a defense drop, then swap into Quagsire, who tanks Iron Tail easily and KOs with a Rain Boosted Surf. Overall, an easy fight. Though I will say her team is much cooler and more threatening than the original two Magnemite Pawns accompanied by King Steelix. After a quick detour to obtain Aerodactyl from the Ruins of Alf, the fossils are obtainable here in Crystal Legacy, and Aerodactyl becomes available after seven badges. It's time to take on the final Team Rocket Johto storyline. I make my way through the Radio Tower, facing new and improved Rocket teams. They actually have decent Pokemon now. And discover the director has been replaced by a doppelganger sprite? He has a difficult team that is not listed in the game documents, but we fortunately handle it without any losses. It gives us access to the key card, which in turn allows us to face our rival for the first time since Burn Tower. He jump scares us in Golden Run Underground. Were you following me, dude? Uh... Oh, you were following me, weirdo. He pretends to forget that we beat him in every fight, then sends out Pupitar. Thinking he was leading Golbat, I had to swap into Quagsire, who tanks a rock slide easily. I keep making that mistake. A Surf Hits is now swapped in Meganium, and I bring out Flareon to counter. A Razor Leaf Body Slam combo does nearly half, but our Flamethrower knocks it out in return. Back out comes Pupitar, so we go back to Quagsire, who takes no damage as Surf knocks out the creepy cocoon. His next Pokemon is Octillery, the Octopus Pokemon. A swap to Ampharos makes quick work of it, and he brings out Houndoom. I counter with Tentacruel as he goes for double team? Come on, man! Tentacruel, of course, misses a Surf and takes massive damage for Bite, but fortunately doesn't allow the charade to continue and takes it out with the Surf. Finally, he brings out Golbat, the Pokemon I thought was leading the team, so we can finally use Aerodactyl. He continues the double team shenanigans, but Aerodactyl isn't having it, taking it down with two Ancient Powers. He tried to make us hate him, Kind of like he does to his Pokemon, but we simply wouldn't allow it. Finally, it's time for the penultimate battle against Rocket Edo. Sporting five Pokemon, this Rocket Grunt is looking for a promotion. Make sure to check out his resume. It's impressive. Fortunately, we came prepared and defeated him without too much trouble. The last stop on the Rocket Train is on the Radio Tower's fifth floor, where Ariana and Archer await us. Ariana is first, leading with the Rocket Classic Arbok. It screeches our Quagsire, but that won't stop an Earthquake from sending it to its slimy grave. She follows with a Vile Plume, so I go into Aerodactyl, taking a Giga Drain. Wing Attack doesn't quite KO, but Arrow is able to dodge a Sleep and finish it off. Persian is out next, so I go to Golem, who eats a bite. After a charm, Rock Slide does a third. Another bite causes a flinch, then the next turn, Rock Slide misses. I love 90% accurate moves. A third straight bite lands, and finally, Rock Slide hits again, bringing Persian to yellow HP. The next turn, Golem fights through a final bite and takes it down. Ariana isn't done, though. She sends out a scary Gyarados, but we have the perfect counter. Ampharos drinks a crit surf and stays in for another and KOs with a thunder punch. Finally, she brings out her Murkrow. I stay in, take a dangerous feint attack, and finish the fight with another punch. A sigh of relief, but we still have to take on Archer. After some team planning, we return to the radio tower and challenge Archer, who has a really cool sprite in this ROM hack. He leads with Weezing, and we instantly take it out with Gengar's Shadow Ball. Next, he sends out Tauros, which I did not realize knows Pursuit until this very moment. This is my best chance to swap, so I do so, and Gengar tanks the Pursuit like a champ as I bring in Togetic. Frustration does decent damage, and we charm down Tauros' attack. He swaps to Headbutt, and another charm brings it to minus four. Now, Frustration's barely doing any damage, but I still charm to minus six to be safe. From here, I swap to my own Tauros, who barely Barely notices the opposing Tauros' frustration, and a couple of rock smashes on our end are enough to take it out. Archer also has a Gyarados, which is totally fine with me. Our hard counter Ampharos comes out and obliterates it with a single punch. Ampharos is also translated to One Punch Pokemon in many languages. He brings out Houndoom, so I swap to Tentacruel. And Archer swaps again to Slowbro. I switch to Noctowl, and Slowbro goes for amnesia. Oh no. I set up light screen, but it gets worse. Slowbro sets up a curse. This thing might wipe our team. I knew that this thing had to be stopped as soon as possible, so I went for a 55% accurate hypnosis, hoping praying for a hit, and it did, sending Slowbro to the snooze zone. Knowing Noctowl won't do enough damage to take it out in time, I bring out Tauros. We have to kill this thing before it wakes up. A headbutt does tiny damage, but it stays asleep. A second nearly brings it to half, and it's still sleeping. At this rate, we're gonna be screwed, but I have to commit to damaging this thing. A third headbutt, critical hits and takes it down. Oh my! That was the biggest scare of the run yet. If that thing woke up and started spamming Psychic, 
That may have been the run. Finally, out comes Houndoom. I switch back to the squid, who easily KOs it with a surf. What a fight. The rockets have really leveled up in this run. After we defeat him, the mystery man from the Lake of Rage comes in and reveals he's Giovanni, and he does not approve Team Rocket's recent actions. Archer, like a lost puppy, leaves the room, confused and forsaken. Now that this part of the story is complete, we can head to Blackthorn City. On the way, I capture a Poliwhirl on Route 44, a Sneasel on Ice Path, and finally a Murkrow on Route 44 that nearly KO'd my entire team, but I decided to throw one last ball, risking crit range on my Ampharos and finally captured it. The Murkrow buff may have been too much somehow. Before facing Claire in the Dragon Gym, I decide to head back to Whirl Island and capture a horsey. This thing will be a beast when we get the Dragon Scale and evolve it to Kingdra. And speaking of beast, I also grab the Rod Encounter in Olivine Harbor, which turns out to be Chen Chao. While not quite as good as when it has the Volt Absorb ability in later generations, this Pokemon has access to insane moves like Surf, Ice Beam, and Thunderbolt. It will be extremely useful for Claire and Lance. Did someone say Claire? Dragon Lady starts off with the classic Dragonair, which I Ice Beam with our newly acquired Lantern. It doesn't quite KO, but her responding Thunder Wave is brushed aside by her Hell Berry. A second attack takes her down, and she brings out her second Blue Snake. Ice Beam once again brings it to red HP, but this time we get the Freeze, stopping her in her tracks. Finally, we get the Freeze this time. After finishing it with another Ice Beam, she brings out her deadly Kingdra. Lantern takes small damage from Dragon Breath as we use Confuse Ray. A Smoke Screen the next turn has no effect as we hit through for almost half with Thunderbolt, but Kingdra begins to recover with Leftovers. I swap to Ampharos to shake the Accuracy Drop, and Kingdra uses another Smoke Screen. I go for Thunder Punch anyway, putting it in yellow health as it goes for a second drop. I decided two drops was enough to swap back to Lantern, but Kingdra finally decides to attack using Hyper Beam and critical hitting our Lantern, taking it down. No, we just got you and you had so much promise too. Fortunately, I'm able to bring Ampharos back in and Thunder Punch it down and quickly do the same to our Gyarados. Finally, she brings out Lapras, which we paralyze but take massive damage from an Ice Beam. I swap to Polyrath, who's able to Rock Smash twice and take it out. Man, what a bummer. That fight was going so well until the critical hit. Oh well, we've beaten the first eight gems with only three losses. I can't really complain. Fortunately, we can replace this awesome Pokemon with a couple of amazing ones right away. The Dragon's Den Elder Peter Jones gives you a Dratini that knows extreme speed simply by asking. The amazing part about this Dratini is that the Elite Four level cap is 55. Does anyone know when Dratini evolves into Dragonite? How about 55? This thing is elite for legal, baby. We also grab the Dragon Scale while in the den, which evolves Seedra into Kingdra. Two dragons in one cave. Not bad. And if those two Pokemon weren't enough, I backtrack all the way back to National Park, the last area in Johto where I've not caught a Pokemon. I heard whispers that it was possible to repel trick a Scyther outside of the bug contest here. Not totally sure which level it would appear at, I raised my coughing to level 16 and used a repel, hoping that I'd get lucky. I walked into the grass and and oh my gosh, we got one. Scyther appears and we capture it. This thing is an absolute hoss and vanilla crystal, and I expect it to be the same in this game. With that, our team is complete and we can head to Victory Road. On our way there, we capture a Goldeen in Tojo Falls, an Arbok on Route 27, and a Rapidash on Route 26. After making our way past some really scary trainers leading up to Victory Road, we finally access the eerily empty cavern of Victory Road. Here, we are confronted by our rival one last time. His thick skull finally has some cracks in it, and he has started to understand that his Pokemon need to be cared for. As he's talking, his pupa evolves into Tyranitar, and the fight begins. He starts with Earth's Ring, which Gligar is able to take down with two Earthquakes. He brings out Octopus next, so I swap into Gyarados, tanking an Ice Beam. A Headbutt does nearly half, and it does massive damage with Hyper Beam. Another Headbutt isn't quite enough to take it down, and weirdly, the text box says it flinched during the recharge turn. Then, all of a sudden, Octillery outspeeds us and hits with another Beam, nearly taking us out. Wow, that was close. His next Pokemon out is Golbat, so we counter with Ampharos, as it starts to double team. No! It lands a Toxic, but fortunately our Thunder Wave hits through the double team and paralyzes it. The next turn we miss a Thunderbolt, take Toxic damage, and it goes for another double team. I decide that my best chance is to stay in for one more attack, and Ampharos comes through in the clutch, hitting through two double teams and KOing Golbat. Now our rival brings out his brand spanking new Tyranitar. I swap to Kingdra, but a critical Earthquake does over half damage. Fortunately, we outspeed and KO with a Surf before it can do any more damage. In comes Meganium, so I bring out our Dragonite as it sets up Sun. A Wing Attack takes it out easily, and he brings out his Dark Dog. I decide to paralyze just in case, but a sun-boosted flamethrower does minimal damage, leading me to stay in and 2 hit KO and win the fight. We have finally made it to the Elite Four, but before we fight, we have a Victory Road encounter. I quickly run back into the cave and catch Rhydon. I was hoping for the rare Steelix, but this will be fine. After two and a half hours of planning, money grinding, move pool swapping, and more, it's time to take on the Crystal Legacy Elite Four. The members' teams look much harder than the vanilla game, so I spent extra time crafting the perfect team. And here it is. We have a Scyther with Wing Attack, Swords Dance, Return, and Cut, Aerodactyl with Earthquake, Rock Slide, 
Ancient Power, and Wing Attack. Gligar with Earthquake, Wing Attack, Faint Attack, and Quick Attack. Dragonite with Wing Attack, Ice Beam, Thunderbolt, and Extreme Speed. Kingdra with Dragon Breath, Agility, Surf, and Ice Beam. And finally, Golem with Rock Slide, Earthquake, Explosion, and Return. First up is the Psychic Guy, William Psychic. I don't know if that's his name, but I also don't know that that is not his name. So William Psychic it is. William Psychic leads with a Giraffe Rig, and I send out Scyther. First turn, I go for Swords Dance and take decent damage from a Psychic. A plus two attack, super effective, stab cut is enough to KO the Giraffe, then his Zatu with Crit, the Slow Twins, and finally his Espeon. Scyther sweeping in the Elite Four, never before seen. Next up is Koga. His Ariados has been buffed, but we have access to the best flying rock in the business. And Ancient Power doesn't quite KO when he goes for Double Team. Fortunately, Aerodactyl is unfazed and takes it out the next turn. Next, he brings out Quillfish, a new addition to the team. I go to Dragonite, who barely notices the Surf and hits for massive Thunderbolt damage. Quillfish is able to get off a Toxic before going down, but Dragonite shakes it off with a Hell Berry. An Extreme Speed finishes it off, and Koga brings out Muck. I decide to stay in with Dragonite, hit for half damage with Wing Attack, and dodge a Toxic. RNG is on our side today. Speaking of RNG, he brings in Crobat, who is holding Bright Powder, and goes for Double Team. This is in the game way too much. Fortunately, Dragonite hits through for a ton of damage. The next turn, Extreme Speed also hits through and kills, avoiding any more accuracy or poison shenanigans. Finally, he brings in Venomoth, and for some reason, I go for Ice Beam instead of Wing Attack, get hit with Sludge Bomb, and Poison. Fortunately, I just use Wing Attack this time and take it out. That fight could have had some awful RNG, but we avoided almost all of it. Awesome start. Third is Encanto, and we lead our Gligar. It nearly KOs Bruno's Hitmonchan with Wing Attack while eating a Dizzy Punch. Another is enough to take it out. Next, Bruno goes straight for Machamp. A Wing Attack does a ton of damage, and his Cross Chop only does a fifth, allowing us to take it down easily. He brings out Hitmonlee, who we take out with a single attack. Now he goes for Steelix, so I bring out Kingdra, who easily handles Steelix's Iron Tail and takes it out with Surf. Finally, he brings out Heracross. After some considering, I swap into Dragonite, and he whiffs a Mega Horn, giving us an easy Wing Attack knockout. Our RNG has been ridiculous in the Elite Four run so far, so let's hope that will continue for the next two fights. Finally, we have reached the Elite Four's ace, Karen. Before the fight, I teach Scyther Swift just in case Umbreon goes for Double Team. I start with Swords Dance, and Umbreon hits us with a Faint Attack, doing decent damage. Scyther goes for a second Swords Dance, but this time Umbreon goes for Double Team. Fearing a Baton Pass, I go for Swift, but it only does half, giving her one more chance to Baton Pass, but it just goes for another Faint Attack, allowing us to take it out. Next up is Murkrow, the Pokemon that nearly wiped our team in the wild. Fortunately, plus four cut is enough to take it out. Same goes for Houndoom, Gengar, which we have to use Wing Attack on, and finally, Vileplume using another Wing Attack. Scyther does it again. Before the Lance fight, I decide to use Metal Coat on Scyther to evolve it into Scizor, giving us a Dragon Resist that we may need for the champion fight. And here it is, the final Johto battle of the game, our chance to defeat the champion. He leads with Gyarados and we counter with Dragonite. Knowing Thunderbolt makes this a foregone conclusion and it goes down. Next, he brings out Aerodactyl, so I swap into Kingdra, who eats a Rock Slide with ease. The next turn, good old 90% Rock Slide misses and we KO with Surf. I love you, Rock Slide. His next Pokemon is the legendary bird, Zapdos. I quickly pivot to our Golem, avoiding a Thunder Wave. The next turn, his Zapdos hits for minimal damage with Sky Attack, and our favorite move, Rock Slide, critical hit KO Zapdos. Rock Slide with an absolutely epic champion sequence. Misses for Lance and crits for me. Some would call Rock Slide a Chad. Lance follows this epic move with Dragonite, and I decide it's Golem's time to shine. And by shine, I mean explode. Dwayne the Golem commits to his final moments, but Dragonite will have nothing of it and knocks him out with a blizzard before he can blow up. Golem, you did a great job giving us a free swap into Kingdra either way. From here, Kingdra is able to slightly outspeed Dragonite and blast him with a quad effective Ice Beam, taking it down. He follows with a second, one level higher Dragonite, but it's not quite high enough to outspeed or avoid a Deathly Ice Beam. Lance's final Pokemon is Charizard, which does outspeed. Kingdra, not perturbed, watches as Charizard attempts to cheese with Double Team. Just, you gotta stop. Come on, Crystal Legacy, you gotta stop that. And we finish it off with a massive surf. Boom, we did it. The Elite Four champion goes down with only one sacrificial loss, but the run doesn't end here. Now it's time to head to Kanto. I'm sure this will be a cakewalk, just like the vanilla game, right? We get to the new region via the SS Aqua, just like in the original. When we arrive in Kanto, the first gym we can face is Surge's Electric gym. The gym leaders have more of an actual order in this game due to the level cap not going backward, thank goodness. Also, there are a ton of new encounters here, so I'm only going to mention those that are relevant. This video is getting really long already. And speaking of thank yous, Crystal Legacy got rid of the worst puzzle in Pokemon history, the trash can switches, allowing us to walk straight up to Surge without wanting to pound our head against a wall. Surge starts with his electrical ball and I send out Rhydon. He sets up rain, so I attempt to waste turns using Fury Attack. The next turn, I go for Scary Face to waste more rain, but the ball explodes. 
I guess he got scared. He follows with Magneton, who sets up Reflect as I continue to stall the rain. Double Edge does minimal damage, and I slow it down with Scary Face. The next turn, I slow it down again and take another slap on the wrist as rain ends. Thanks to Scary Face, I can take it down without it being able to set up another rainstorm. He brings out Lantern, so I swap into Kingdra to eat a Surf, and then swap into Quagsire to dodge a Thunderbolt. Plays! Lantern hits us with a Surf, but an Earthquake takes it down in response. Next, Surge brings out Ampharos, who hits us with a Critical Iron Tail, but our Earthquake is just too powerful. Raichu's out next, so I swap to Dragonite, who takes a Surf from Raichu? Surfing Pikachu is real! And then Dragonite quickly takes it out with two extreme speeds. But not before his Raichu is able to summon the rain. Fortunately, his last Pokemon, Electabuzz, doesn't benefit from the rain in any way, so it was a wasted move. To avoid an Ice Punch, I swap out Dragonite for Ampharos. After taking both the Ice Punch and a Submission, I paralyze Electabuzz with Thunder Wave, then set up a Light Screen as Electabuzz is paralyzed. From here, Paraflinch Strategies cheeses us to victory. Great start to the Kanto Gym Leaders, but as you can see, they have real high-level Pokemon and decent coverage. This won't be a cakewalk like we're used to. The next gym challenge is Erica. She leads Jump Luff and we send out Bird with Hat. A Drill Peck quickly KOs her first Pokemon and she follows with Pseudo Udo. I swap to Gligar who tanks a Rock Slide. Earthquake does over half as another Rock Slide brings us to half HP before we take it down. Venusaur comes out next so I swap into our hard counter Crobat who eats a Solar Beam and takes it down with two wing attacks. She brings out Executor and I counter with Kingdra who takes massive damage from Psychic. Risking crit range, I stay in an Ice Beam only for it to freeze and save Kingdra's butt. After another Ice Beam takes it down, she brings out Rocket James's face. Favorite Pokemon. A switch to Sizor dodges its Sludge Bomb, allowing us to hit for massive damage with Wing Attack and dodges Sleep Powder for the next turn, finishing it off. Finally, she sends out Blossom, which only has one attacking move, Solar Beam. I stay in and do almost half with a Wing Attack, and she sets up Sun. Another Wing Attack brings her down to 1 HP, and a Sleep Powder is nullified by her Held Berry. Expecting a Potion, I use another Wing Attack and just take it out. I guess she's nuzlocke as well. Before we can take on Misty, we have to do the Kanto storyline involving the Rogue Team Rocket member stealing the machine part. This is unchanged from Vanilla. While doing this, I Master Ball an Abra. You aren't getting away from me, sucker. Misty time. She starts with Golduck, and I send out our newly Master Balled Alakazam. A Thunder Punch nearly KOs the duck, as it does nearly half with Surf. A second punch takes it down, and she brings out Vaporeon. I swap to Ampharos, who takes a critical Shadow Ball, doing nearly half. Vaporeon then goes for Acid Armor as we paralyze with Thunder Wave. I decide to set up Light Scream, which minimizes Vaporeon's Surf, and we heal back with a Berry. Thunderbolt then leaves it on 1 HP, and we eat another Surf. After finishing it off, Misty goes into Quagsire, forcing us to swap into Victory Bell as we take massive damage from Earthquake. A Rain Dance the next turn is scary, but we KO with Razor Leaf. Her next Pokemon is Kingdra, and we've already seen how much of a beast this Pokemon is on our own team. So the only answer is to swap into our own Kingdra, taking an Ice Beam with ease. From here, I decide to get greedy and go for Agility, hoping to sweep the rest of her team and take another Ice Beam. A Dragon Breath nearly takes her out, and we dodge another Freeze from Ice Beam as we take her down. She brings out Lapras, so I stay in and Dragon Breath for half damage, and Lapras sets up Reflect. The next turn, another Dragon Breath critical hits to KO, bringing us to our final Pokemon, Starmie. Expecting a Psychic, I swap into Sneasel, and we dodge it. Let's go. After much deliberating with the chat about how Beat Up works, and if it counts as a dark move, I decide to go for it and find out that it sucks. We hit for nearly half damage, not super effectively, and take massive damage from Surf. I decide to YOLO a faint attack, but Starmie survives on red HP, surfing us to death. We barely survive, taking it down with a final faint attack. Sneasel for the win. Next is the newly revamped Janine. Her Pokemon are not level 30, guys. Yay! She starts off with a Weezing, and I bring out Gligar. An Earthquake does over half, and it just goes for Amnesia, as I finish it with a second Earthquake. Next out is Tentacruel, so I swap to Kingdra and take an Ice Beam. Another Ice Beam hits as we Dragon Breath for a third. After a scary back and forth, dodge freezes and taking tons of damage, Kingdra takes it down. Next is Muck, so I swap to Alakazam and it shrinks itself. Realizing I swapped to the wrong Pokemon, I go to Sizor and dodge a Sludge Bomb. After a wing attack does minimal damage, I decide to Swords Dance to max attack so that when we finally do hit, it will take it out. But thanks to Acid Armor, it takes even longer than expected. Fortunately, it can hit us and we finally take out the Muck, so she brings out Nidto Queen. Because her plus six attack, I decide to stay in and take it down. Her Crobat also has nothing that hurts us, so Sizor stays in for another one shot. Finally, she brings out Venomoth, which we clean up after a few double teams. Well, well done, Sizor. 12 badges down, 4 in Kanto, and 4 left to go. After catching Snorlax and giving us access to Diglett Cave, we can fight Brock. He leads off with Golem, which is also holding a Quick Claw, but our luck is on point and our starter takes it down with no issue. Finally, for alligators being used. Honestly, looking back, I should have picked Cyndaquil as our starter because there are way less fire types. I barely have used my starter all run. Brock falls with Kabutops, so I swap to Victory Bell, but he also swaps into Aerodactyl. I'm forced to swap again into Kingler, who takes massive damage from Sky Attack. Another Sky Attack nearly KOs us, but we survive and hit for massive damage with Surf. I protect a turn 
for good measure, then decide to sack Kingler for a safe swap in. R.I.P. From here, I bring for Alligator back in, take a Sky Attack, and finish it off with Surf. He decides to bring Kabutops back in, so I swapped a Victory Bell as it starts a Sword Stance. Fortunately, we outspeed and knock it out with a Razor Leaf. Next out is Omastar, so I swap to Kingdra and take an Ice Beam, which freezes. I attempt to thaw out, but get critical hit down to red HP, force against the swap into for Alligator, who also takes an Ice Beam. A Surf deals half to Omastar, but we tank a Surf in return, then take it out. Go Starter! His next Pokemon is Tyranitar, who attempts to Thunderbolt, but we dodge it with a swap to Gligar. An Earthquake does three quarters, and his returning Rock Slide does almost half, allowing us to finish it with a second Quake. Finally, he brings out his now evolved Steelix. Due to our water types being either knocked out or significantly injured, I stay in with Gligar and Critical Earthquake. And thank goodness we did, because Steelix goes for a curse. A second Earthquake is just enough to take it down. Had we not crit there, Gligar was probably in big trouble. Before our next badge, we scrounge up enough money to buy Larvitar at the Celadon City Game Corner. Tyranitar has an awesome moveset and solid typing, and apparently everyone in this game has one, so I expect it will be useful for the remainder of the run. Our 14th badge is Sabrina, who had visions of our arrival. But did she have visions of our victory? Let's see. She starts with Mr. Mime, star of Detective Pikachu. Mime Psychic does decent damage, but Sizor takes it down with a super effective cut. Sabrina goes for Hypno, which does Fire Punch. I go to Kingdra, and it goes for Hypnosis instead? Fortunately, it misses a couple of times, and we do decent damage with Dragon Breath. Finally, it hits, but our Hellberry wakes Kingdra up, allowing us to knock it down to red HP. Hypno then manages to hit back-to-back -back times, so I swap into Murkrow, dodging a Dream Eater. Fan Attack takes it down- What? Focus Band keeps it alive? And we take a submission, which then KOs itself. What? What in the world just happened? Next out is Jinx, so I bring out Flareon to tank Ice Beam and get frozen. Our Hellberry heals us, but this allows Jinx's kiss to put us to sleep with no way to heal. Terrible luck. I swap the Scizor and get crit instantly by Psychic. This Jinx is going to end our run if it keeps up like this. Expecting another Psychic, I swap to Murkrow for the free dodge, but it goes for a lovely kiss and thankfully misses. If that hit, we were completely screwed. I decide to risk it, staying with Murkrow, who's able to clutch it with a faint attack. Her next Pokemon is even more scary, Alakazam. I swap into Kingdra to take a Thunder Punch, then pivot into Tyranitar for the Psychic Dodge. After taking another Thunder Punch, Crunch takes it down. She brings out Slowbro, so I go into Gyarados. A Surf does minimal damage, and I start to bite, hoping for a flinch. After one Surf, we get the flinch we were looking for and finish it off. Her final Pokemon is Wobbuffet, which doesn't have any attacking moves, but has the ever-dangerous Destiny Bond. I slowly whittle it down with Nightshade, and once it goes below half, it starts to Destiny Bond. Leftovers recovers it to above half, then I go for Faint Attack and win the fight. That got really dicey for a bit, but we pulled it off with no losses. Now I quickly make my way to Blaine, who's hiding in a cave. He starts with a Flaming Horse, but our Aerodactyl outspeeds and avoids Quick Claw proc, allowing us to Earthquake it down. He brings out Magmar, who already took out a Pokemon in this run. So I bring out Kingdra, who gets hit with the Confuse Ray. I decide to hit through, and we fortunately get the Surf off and take it down. Out comes Arcanine, so I swap to Tyranitar, who gets paralyzed by Dragon Breath. Fortunately, our berry heals us, but Arcanine's Fire Blast instantly burns us on the next turn, causing our Earthquake to do just under half. Afraid of losing Titar, I swap to Arrow, who tanks a Fire Blast, then knocks it out with an Earthquake. He falls with Ninetales, who survives Earthquake and sets up Sun. Another Quake takes it down, and Blaine goes for Houndoom. I swap to Tentacruel and eat a Solar Beam. A Surf does half thanks to the Sun, and another Solar Beam brings us below half, procking our berry. Another Surf takes it out, and Blaine brings out his final Pokemon, the legendary bird Moltres. The Sun fades, so I decide to stay in and Surf for a ton of damage, but Moltres Sky Attack is too powerful, taking us down. No, not Tentacruel! Fortunately, we're able to come in and outspeed Aerodactyl, winning the fight. Sad loss, but we have our 15th badge. Before our fight with Blue, I catch a Magnemite. As mentioned before, our final gym fight is against Blue. Known as one of the best trainers in the game, this will be a hard fight. After mocking the Johto region, he accepts our challenge. He starts with the legendary bird Articuno, and I send out our newly acquired Magneton. An Ice Beam doesn't freeze, and a returning Thunderbolt KOs. I knew he'd be useful. He brings out Machamp, and our Gligar swap dodges an Earthquake. A Wing Attack does a ton of damage, but his body Body slam does over half. We're able to knock him out the next turn, and he brings out Gyarados. I swap to our dragon, who easily takes a Hydro Pump and finishes it with a quad effective Thunderbolt. Now for Alakazam, who does massive damage with Psychic, but gets KO'd by Dragonite's Wing Attack. Arcanine comes out next, so I swap into Kingdra, as Arcanine goes for a Curse. This allows us to outspeed, unless he goes for extreme speed. But fortunately, we tank it and surf the dog to death. His final Pokemon is Executor, which takes a couple of Ice Beams, and we win our final badge. That went pretty well. Now we can head to Trainer Red. Uh, or can we? According to Professor Oak, we have to face the Elite Four again before we can face Red? This video is already a marathon, so let's jump right into the Elite Four rematches. First up is William Psychic, Master of Telekinesis. We don't have a Scyther this time, let's see how Scyzor will do. Cut is able to one-hit KO his giraffe, and William sends out his newly acquired Ninetales. I swap to Kingdra, who easily takes Flamethrower. Ninetales sets up Reflect, and somehow survives a Surf on one HP? The next turn it survives again due to Focus Ban, not this item again! Another Confuse Ray the next turn is dangerous, and we hit ourselves in Confusion. I swap 
swap to Dragonite to shake the confusion and easily take a Shadow Ball. And Extreme Speed finally hits through the Focus Band and KOs. Annoying! Next out is Espeon. I decide to swap to T-Tar and avoid a Psychic, then take a Resisted Shadow Ball and KO with Crunch. William follows with his Cursing Slowbro, so I bring Dragonite back out. A Thunderbolt brings it to red health as it continues to curse, allowing us to easily KO it. Slowbro tells his dad on us, and out comes Slowking. A Thunderbolt does half, and he paralyzes in return. I go for Extreme Speed to hit first and nearly take it down, and a Psychic does about a quarter. Another Extreme Speed takes it out, and William sends out Zatu. I decide to stay in with Paralyzed Dragonite, taking a Psychic, and finish the fight with Thunderbolt. William's Psychic has been defeated yet again. Second round versus Koga. His lead is Quillfish, which hits pretty hard with a Waterfall. A Sword Stance boosted Wing Attack does over half, but three straight Waterfalls bring Sizor into yellow health. He brings out Muck, so I switch into Arrow, who tanks a Fire Blast. Earthquake nearly KOs, and Muck goes for Minimize. Then inexplicably swaps to Gligar. I decide to swap myself as it goes for the classic Double Team. Fortunately, Kingdra is unfazed and takes it out with a Surf. He sends Muck back out to certain death, and we drown the slime in water. His next Pokemon is Quick Claw Spore Parasect. I decide to stay in for Ice Beam damage, and it knocks it out in one hit. He falls with the Spider, which we Ice Beam for half, but then watch it go for Double Team. Our second one misses, and he hits us with Toxic, but our Hellberry heals us. I decide to swap into Gligar for Faint Attack and also get Toxic. Faint Attack doesn't quite kill, and a second Toxic ensures that we stay poisoned. A final Faint Attack finishes it off, and out comes his Ace Crobat. I swap into Titar, and Crobat sets up Double Team. The next turn, a Bite flinches, then he sets up Confuse Ray, which is healed by our Berry. Now we have to hit a 90% accurate move through a double team. And it does, winning us the fight. Rock Slide RNG has been awesome for this run. Take that, Koga. Third is Disney Reference, which leads Steelix. Kingdra starts us off strong with the Surf Kill. Hitmonchan comes out, so I swap into Dragonite, who tanks submission. Wing attacks enough to KO, so he brings out his new addition, Ursaring. I decide to stay in and hit for over half, and Ursaring goes for Curse. I go for Ice Beam, hoping for a freeze, but it survives and hits for a ton of damage with Strength. Extreme Speed finishes it off, and we bring out his Ace, Machamp. I swap into Gligar and take decent damage from Rock Slide. A couple of Wing Attacks takes it out as Gligar eats more rocks. Next out is Paper Thin Hitmon Lee. I swap to Aerodactyl, who I think could sweep the rest of his Pokemon. Hitmonlee goes for Meditate, allowing us to KO with Wing Attack without any damage, and then we do the same to his final Pokemon, Heracross. Elite Four Ace Karen awaits us next. She starts off with her ever-annoying Umbreon, and I start off with a cut from Sizor, doing three quarters. Another cut misses, and she heals with Moonlight. I decide to Sword Stance, then after another Moonlight, take it out with Cut. She follows with Houndoom, so I swap to Kingdra, who takes both a Flamethrower and a Crunch before taking it down with the Tidal Wave. Vileplume comes out next, and Kingdra stays in for an Ice Beam, knocking it down to low enough health to prevent Vileplume's substitute, making an easy fodder for a second Ice Beam. She brings out Gengar, which I counter with Aerodactyl. Gengar's Confuse Ray is nullified by our Barry, which allows us to KO with an Earthquake, avoiding any Destiny Bond shenanigans. Now for Mischievous, which anticipates our swap to Gligar and puts us to sleep. Gligar munches a Barry, wakes up, and hits for tons of damage with Earthquake, then dodges Hypnosis and finishes it with a second Earthquake. Her final Pokemon is Murkrow, so I hard counter with Tyranitar. After tanking a Sky Attack and healing from Confusion, Titar finishes the fight with a Rock Slide, bringing us to the champion fight. Lance leads with his classic Gyarados, which we easily take down with a Bolt of Thunder. He brings in his Zapdos replacement, Tyranitar. I told you everyone has this Pokemon. To avoid a rock move, I bring out Gligar, who dodges Rock Slide. This is, in fact, the best move of all time. The next turn, his Quick Claw goes off and he double teams. Fortunately, we hit through and do a ton of damage. The next turn, he swaps in his first Dragonite, causing me to swap in our Dragonite counter, Kingdra. Kingdra tanks a Blizzard and thankfully doesn't freeze, allowing us to one-hit KO with Ice Beam. Lance then goes for his bigger Dragonite, so we just click Ice Beam again. Now for his speedy Aerodactyl. After considering a swap, I decided my best move is to stay in and surf, tanking a huge sky attack, and finishing it off in one hit. Titar is back out, and I decide to risk the quick claw proc and go for a surf to KO, and it doesn't go off, giving us an easy kill. Finally, he brings out his Charizard, which outspeeds us. Again, I decide to stay in, and Kingdra easily tanks an earthquake, finishing the Charizard with another wall of water. Kingdra is amazing! Now that we've defeated Lance for the second time, we can finally take on the legendary Trainer Red atop Mount Silver. After tons of team planning and some TM hunting, it's time for the final battle. A man of many words, Red woos us into battle with him. He leads off with a level 93 Pikachu, which easily goes down to Aerodactyl's Earthquake. I always wonder if we could just make it level 100, because Pikachu is just Pikachu, and Earthquake is always just going to be too good for it. Next is the iconic Blastoise, so I bring in the MVP of our run, Kingdra, who dodges Hydro Pump. Not only strong, but elusive as well. After going back and forth with Dragon Breath and Earthquake for a few turns, Kingdra eventually takes it down, making way to the horrifying Snorlax. I swap to Togetic, a Pokemon we haven't seen in ages in this run, as Snorlax 
Snorlax sets up Amnesia. That won't matter for this matchup. I start with Toxic, and Snorlax goes for Curse. Now this we do have to keep an eye on. Fortunately, Togetic knows Charm, and we're able to keep charming down Snorlax's attack as it continues to curse. We go back and forth for several turns, lowering its attack as Snorlax curses, until it eventually goes for an extremely weak Body Slam, and we protect the final turn as Toxic finishes it off. His fourth Pokemon is Charizard, and I decide to stay in and go for Toxic, which misses twice in a row, but Charizard's Outrage confuses and hurts itself, allowing us to get a third Toxic off. After a couple of Protect, Charm, and Sweet Kiss turns, Charizard eventually perishes to poison damage. Now Red brings out his new team member, Mewtwo. At this point, I decide to let Togetic perish in order to get a clean swap. A longtime team member and a very helpful member for this fight takes a Psychic and goes down. I bring out Sizor, who takes a ton of damage from two Psychics, but Cut is able to two-hit KO easily. Finally, Red brings out his final Pokemon, Venusaur. I stay in, avoid a Sleep Powder, and hit for over half with Wing Attack. The next Sleep Powder hits, though, forcing us to swap into Dragonite, who takes a Body Slam, paralyzing us, but our Berry heals us and allows our Dragonite to make the final move against Venusaur, winning us the run. Wow, that was one heck of a ROM hack. This game felt so much like Original Crystal, but actually good. While not difficulty hack levels of challenging, it was certainly much more difficult than any vanilla Pokemon game. As a huge Crystal fan, I loved playing through this and seeing many Johto Mons get the respect they deserve due to the placement in the game, slight buffs, or just seeing them on opposing trainers team. I would highly recommend this hack to anyone who's a Generation 2 fan. I know you all will enjoy it. If you enjoyed this video and made it this far, be sure to subscribe. I'll be doing more runs for both vanilla games and ROM hacks in the future. And one final shout out to Smith for making a really awesome game. And shout out to ArrowGod223 for the assistance on Twitch. His knowledge was invaluable to our run success. Oh, but there's one more challenge for us to face? I heard rumors of a powerful trainer at the trainer school in Viridian City. As the strongest trainers in both regions, I had to check it out for myself.